All right, so this week's topic is band plans. I see we have Nick also, and so, and Denny. Um, these are hams with lots of experience. So if you, if anybody has anything that they'd like to add, uh, feel free to chime in. Um, Scott, I see you're on too. So I, going top down, this is um, kind of the national band plan for US amateurs. Um, we do share a lot of similar frequencies with uh, the US versus other countries like the EU countries, uh, Canada, Mexico, South America. So this band plan that you see here is similar, but not exactly the same as a lot of the other countries hold throughout the world. Um, and there are organizations um, that get together every once in a while to kind of uh, propose new bands um, and to sometimes unfortunately remove bands uh, from amateur and give them to commercial. But for right now, this is the most updated uh, band plan. And I downloaded this from the ARRL and that's ARRL.org. And you can just search ARRL band plan and they have um, several uh, PDF versions of this uh, color, black and white, large vertical, this is their horizontal version. And it's a really great reference. And if, if you have no other reference, I would highly suggest you get uh, this printed out and either laminated or put somewhere by your radio. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that they break up some of the different lines as uh, E, A, and G. So, um, and also M, so, or a T also. Um, and so what these are is the T is uh, technician, N is novice. You can't get your novice license anymore, but anybody that has a, a novice license can continue to renew that. Um, and it shows you what each of the um, classes of licenses has uh, as banned privileges. So one of the things you'll notice is that above six meters, which is the 50 megahertz, that the technician uh, has all privileges above 50 megahertz, which is one of the awesome things about getting your technician license. Um, it's the first license that you can get, but it essentially opens the world to all VHF and UHF and even microwave frequencies. So if you wanna talk um, using a handheld or mobile radio, um, a technician license is really all you need. Um, the Frequencies are the bands below 50 megahertz though, primarily are um, general, advanced, and extra. And advanced is a license that you can no longer uh, get, but those who have advanced licenses are grandfathered into the particular um, frequencies that they are allowed to use. Um, one of the questions today, I think was, uh, during in the registration was uh, what's, the difference between like a technician and a general uh, as far as CW goes uh, for band plan privileges. And a technician, you can see, um, doesn't they have some privileges down here on 40 meters, on 15 meters, and it's these squiggly lines here, and 80 meters. And that's pretty much um, below 10 megahertz. Uh, that is the only privileges that technicians have um, and novices too. Uh, and the reason is kind of called incentive licensing. So the FCC and ARRL uh, have this idea that once you get a taste of uh, ham radio, um, that you will be incentivized to upgrade to your general and extra tickets um, because you get more and more privileges. And so the general really is the one that opens up your privileges for everything below uh, 10 meters or 20 megahertz. So you'll see that a general, they don't have all of the 20 meter uh, frequencies available to them in the 20 meter band, but they have a significant portion. And even 30 meters, 40 meters, 80 meters, 160 meters, um, there are a lot of uh, frequencies that you can use. And the HF, which is everything below six meters, really is the frequencies that you want to use when you're talking around the world, at least not using the internet or any other uh, kind of technology that extends your, your reach. So I highly recommend um, just go download this, uh, post it by your radio, 
uh, especially if you're operating HF, because you'll want to know where you can and cannot transmit. Any questions on the AWRL, the national band plane? One more thing I'd like to point out is that um, you'll see that the colors here indicate like the red color is radian data, where the green color is phone and image. Uh, phone is another word for voice. Um, so if you're going to talk on the 10 meter band and you want to talk on single sideband or voice, then you want to use 28.3 uh, to 29.7. Uh, you don't want to go down into the red area 28.0 to 28.3. Uh, one note here, and it's the first one here, CW operation is permitted throughout all amateur bands. Um, so you could, yes, technically transmit at uh, 29 megahertz using CW, but generally you kind of want to stay in the, the RIDI and data area for um, using CW. So technically, yes, you could use CW invoice, there's two reasons that you don't want to. Number one, it's kind of a gentleman's agreement or proper operating protocols to kind of use the this band plan or follow it at least. And number two, you're gonna have much better success making other CW contacts if you are using CW in the appropriate areas of the band versus in the voice section. You probably also make more friends too. So, this national band plan uh, for the two meters, if you take a look here, um, there's a big stretch between 144.1 uh, and 148. It doesn't really say anything about uh, where repeaters are located, where simplex channels are located, where you should do digital versus where you uh, should operate um, single sideband or weak signal CW or um, international voice. And that's where the, the regional band plans come in. And so this here is from the Oregon Region Relay Council. And you can actually see all their band plans. They have one for um, six meters, most of the, the upper frequencies. So six meters, two meters, 70 centimeters. Um, and this is Oregon specific. So you'll see here that what they've done is uh, from 144.01 to 144.05 is EME or Earth, Moon, Earth. And that's uh, CW in, in particular. And it, it, they, they say it's uncoordinated, see the ARRL band plan. But what they're doing is they're uh, breaking these, uh, these frequencies apart to say that, for example, Earth, Moon, Earth, CW, this is where you want to operate. If you wanted to do general single sideband, um, this is where you want to operate. You'll also see uh, repeater inputs in the blue. So here's some here between 144 dot five one to one forty four dot eight nine and then again some more here one forty six dot oh two one forty six dot oh four um, and then the respective outputs uh, in the uh, darker orange and what you'll find is that these repeater inputs that uh, so most repeaters are designated by their output frequency so repeaters here that are uh, displayed in the orange like 145.11, they're going to have a minus offset. I'm sorry, a plus offset. So their input is um, going to be somewhere here between 146.02 and 146.4. Most of the time, ham radios, especially modern ones that have been built probably in the last 20 to 25 years, have automatic um, repeater offsets. So if you were to take your either handheld or mobile radio and you were to punch in 147.040, which is a popular Portland repeater, then it would automatically either uh, shift your input frequency, either minus or plus, depending on where it falls in this band plan. Does that make sense? Or any questions? So some they uh, will leave out they some frequencies here like between 145.51, 145.99. This is a, a large segment, uh, 480 kilohertz, that is dedicated to miscellaneous and experimental. 
Simplex is in the pink. So they have, we have uh, two segments of Simplex frequencies, 146.42 to 146.60. And the national calling frequency for Simplex, 146.52, is actually right in the middle there of that, that band plan or that segment of frequencies. Um, and the national calling frequency is kind of the, the general uh, accepted frequency in the nation where if you wanted to make a contact or you wanted a frequency to listen to while you're driving your RV from Portland to Texas, that's definitely where you want to listen. Because if there's any place, at least on Simplex, and this is non-repeater, so Simplex um, calling is done is on 146.52. And then we also have another chunk of Simplex frequency between 147.4 and 147.58. And one of the things that will vary from region to region is the, the channel spacings. And you can see that for both of these simplex spacings that we use here in Oregon, 20 kilohertz channels, which means that you have 146.42. So the next uh, simplex frequency would be 146.44, 146.4, six, 146.48. So you're going up 20 kilohertz at a time. Whereas in California, it's 15 kilohertz uh, spacing. So for them, if this was their band plan, then it would be 146.42 is the first one, 146.435, 146. <laughs> Can I count in 15 kilohertz spacings? Um, three, four, uh, 146.46. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah. So if you want to take a look at this and, and find out like where you should and shouldn't transmit, um, particularly if you're thinking of putting up a repeater, um, make sure you check out whatever regional band plan um, that you are in. So ORRC.org has all the band plans for six meters on up for the Oregon uh, region. And just for fun, I put in the Northern California region band plan. So this is a completely separate relay council. And this is what their two meter band plan looks like. Hey, so, hey Max, uh, yeah. this is Lakshmi, I had a question. Yeah. So uh, the, I saw simplex repeater there. And in my ham exam, which I didn't take too long ago, <laughs> it said simplex was direct communication. So what's a simplex repeater? So a simplex repeater is kind of a, a store and forward. So um, I don't, I actually don't know of any around here. Um, I think you could probably just set one up without um, coordination, but essentially it's, you could probably even do it with one radio. So let's say you had a radio in a, in a tiny, like little, uh, almost like a computer device, although it doesn't even need to be, have the smarts of a computer. And you could put that on a mountain or the top of a building. And so when you're talking, it's all simplex. So it's all one frequency. When you talk, then the little device uh, at the repeater site is recording what you're saying. And when you unkey, then that uh, device knows that there's no more carrier there. And then it will transmit exactly what you just said. And okay. so it it's a repeater that to use, it takes twice as long as any other normal repeater takes. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that probably that's one of the reasons that they're not used very much is because, uh, you know, if you if you have a 10 second message, it takes 20 seconds to actually transmit it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So one of the things about um, uh, the Northern California region band plan is that there's a lot fewer uh, simplex frequencies. Um, and that's because they have a lot more uh, repeaters that they have on their band plan. You can see the large um, sections of dark orange, which are the repeater outputs. And it might be actually inputs and outputs on this one. Yeah, I think it's inputs and outputs. Um, and on the 70 centimeter uh, region band plan, which I don't have here, um, they actually uh, have so many uh, 440 repeaters 
that they only have three simplex frequencies. Um, here in Oregon, we have a lot more than three simplex frequencies, so it's a lot nicer to be able to at least use simplex on um, 70 centimeters here in Oregon. And here you can see that the uh, they specify below 146 megahertz is 20 kilohertz uh, FM channel spacing, and above 146 is 15 kilohertz. And so simplex is going to be the um, this light blue, and I don't believe they have any simplex below 146.4. So which essentially means that all of their simplex frequencies are 15 kilohertz spacing. And you can see that they list out the 146.52 as their nationwide FM calling frequency. All right, so. This is uh, an example of an organization band plan. And I just grabbed this off the Multnomah County Aries website. And so this band plan doesn't necessarily specifically say, well, you know, this is where you can do simplex and this is where you can uh, do repeaters, but it's more um, assigning um, channels to um, like a band plan. So if you wanted to program your radio, I the first thing that I would do, especially if I lived in Multnomah County, would be to go to this their website, multnomahshares.org, and find the specific band plan that you want to program into your repeater. And they do have um, band frequency lists that are for radios with um, a small number of memories, such as the Baofeng, which only has 128 memories, versus uh, those that have large number of memories, so like 500 or more channels which is pretty nice because then if you're not limited to a smaller um, memory uh, or frequency list, if you have something that can hold a thousand or more channels. So just as an example, uh, they recommend in channel one or memory location one that you store MC1. And MC1 is this 146.84 repeater, which is one of the um, Park uh, Portland Amateur Radio Club repeaters. And they describe it what it is here. It's the Multnomah Primary Repeater, Command Net, Large Mountain, Washington. And actually, I take that back. So that's probably, no, I guess that is um, one of the park repeaters that just happens to be in Washington. And they give you some information, like it's a negative 0.6 megahertz offset. So this is the 146.84 is the frequency that you would listen on. But then if you wanted to transmit through that repeater, then you would want to take 146.84 and subtract 600 kilohertz, which would give you 146.24. Is that right? Yeah. Like I said, most of the time, amateur radios are smart enough that if you plug in 146.84, the radio already knows that that's a repeater frequency. And so it will automatically add a negative offset to that particular um, channel, whether it's a memory channel or even VFO. Any questions so far? So Max, in any band plan, the frequency that is listed is always the receive frequency, is it? For repeaters, um, yes. Uh, some uh, repeater directories uh, will give you both the input and output. Although I will say that I would, uh, in my experience, most repeater directories will only give you the output frequency and that's the frequency that you want to listen on. Uh, and then they will either give you like just a symbol, like a, a plus or a minus. Um, and so remember that two meters is always the standard offset is 600 kilohertz and 70 centimeters is five megahertz offset. Um, and sometimes they'll list the negative with what the offset actually is. There are very few repeaters that use what they call um, non-standard offset. And if you do run into a repeater that, for example, lists the output frequency and then like, let's say negative one or one megahertz, that would definitely be a non-standard offset. Your radio, um, if it was built in the last 20 years, 
can uh, be programmed with um, non-standard offsets, but usually it's a multi-step process. I wouldn't worry about that too much. I've actually never used a repeater with a non-standard offset. Um, most of the time you'll run into that if you're using radios for GMRS, for example, which is not ham radio, um, but sometimes that happens. Uh, there may be places that um, use non-standard offsets if, for example, there's um, a known uh, interference on a particular offset, um, or if there, it's just a small community that, for whatever reason, that's just the way they've done it since the 1950s. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? This. Uh, well, go ahead. When you're programming your, you know, from the repeater book, or if you're programming manually, so then you don't, if you just put these repeater frequencies in, say your bow finger, or whatever, will automatically put the offset in on these particular ones, the ones that are repeaters, is that correct? Yes, uh, we'll have Unless to, uh, yeah, there's one kind of, uh, the bow fung is really the exception. Bao fung is not an easy, radio to program manually just with the keys on the front and i'm talking specifically the uh, uv5r which is the standard one that's the most popular that you've all seen um, they do have some other ones that are upgraded and a little bit smarter the baofeng the way that you program it is that you program in the output frequency which is the one that you listen on but then you also have to program the input frequency um, so it's a little bit different however um, a standard radio, like either ICOM, Kenwood, Yesu, like the Yesu FT60 is probably the most common beginner radio. It's the one that I still use today after 30 years of ham radio. When you type in 146.84, even in the VFO, which is the mode that you t uh, just program your radio in, it will automatically put up a negative sign on the top. And that indicates that if you were to push the push to talk button, that it would not transmit on 146.84, it would transmit on the negative offset, which is 146.24. So that's a great question, Scott. Does that make sense? Yes, it, yes, it does. And that sounds like a selling point for Yesu. Yeah, it, uh, all of the major ones do it. Uh, Yesu, Kenwood, Alinko. Um, I would say that uh, like even my, um, original ICOM radio that I bought uh, over 30 years ago, uh, we'll do that too. Great, thank you. Yeah, sometimes um, because not all regional band plans are the same, uh, sometimes you may run into a frequency depending on where you are um, that for some reason your radio seems to want to put in either a negative or positive offset when in fact you want to actually use it for simplex and it is allowed according to the band plan. In that case, you may have to look at your manual to find out how to turn off that offset. And the other thing that you can kind of run into sometimes with programming your radio, uh, especially on the key face, is um, if somehow you turned off the automatic repeater offset. And so just as an example, I think most radios do this, but the Yesu has a menu selection where you can turn off the ARO is what they call it, automatic repeater offset. And then when you punch in 146.84, it may not give you that offset. It may just say, okay, you turned it off. I'm, not, I'm just gonna treat this as a simplex frequency unless you tell me otherwise. I have a question, which is, uh, how stable are these band plans? I mean, if you programmed your radio this year, um, you know, is, 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 are you still going to be in good shape next year and the year after and the year after? Yeah, if you lived in the same area, for example, this Multnomah County Aries band plan um, or frequency list um, is probably not going to change a whole lot um, in the next, you know, one to five years. And this simply for a couple of reasons. Um, repeaters generally, um, especially the ones that are coordinated that have been there a long time, they aren't going to change. Um, in fact, uh, even if for whatever reason, Portland Amateur Radio Club says, okay, we're not going to 
use this repeater up here on Large Mountain anymore. And another, you know, Washington or, uh, Amateur Radio Club decides to use 146.84. Um, that 146.84 slash 146.24, that's called a uh, frequency pair. That, that won't change either. So I would say that once you program them in, uh, there may be some small changes. Uh, for example, maybe um, you know, two years, three years, five years from now, somebody will say, you know what? Instead of having two tactical nets, we really should just have one tactical net, and and we should assign this one to like, like another local, you know, wind link or something like that. So that will occasionally happen, um, but it's not especially at the, this low level, um, it's not really much of a concern because if you are part of Multnomah County Aries, for example, or another organization, then if you are a regular member of their meetings and stuff, they'll probably let you know of all the changes that happen. I would say that the regional stuff, uh, for example, this one or the Oregon Regional Relay Council uh, doesn't change very often at all, if, if ever. And the national band plan very rarely changes. There, there have been changes. I'll give you one example. This two, uh, 2,200 meters and the 630 meters down here, those are actually new for amateur radio. Um, I believe, I wanna say 2017, don't quote me on the, the exact year, but those uh, were at first experimental and only people with uh, experimental licenses granted by the FCC could actually use them. But then at some point around 2017, they decided to open it up to uh, all licensed amateur radio operators. Um, so uh, nobody uh, sends me email. If you're gonna use the 2200 meters, you do need to register uh, or I guess, it's not really even register. It's more like you send an email to the Utilities Technology Council and you can actually get the form uh, at, that, at this link right here. Uh, and the basic concept is if you don't hear back from them in 30 days, then you're fine to uh, transmit on the 2200 meter band. And the reason is because um, the utilities uh, around the country were worried that amateurs transmitting on 2200 meters might interfere with some of their substations and other equipment. Cool, any other questions on either national, regional, or um, I want I call this a local band plan. It's not really a band plan more, it's a kind of a frequency list because there could be some other uh, organization in um, the Portland area or Multnomah County that has something similar. Um, but they wouldn't necessarily say, okay, use 146.84 as simplex because it's already uh, has a repeater. It's designated as a repeater frequency. Max, question? Yeah. Uh, this is Lee. Um, can you say anything about the tones and how do they come about? How are they decided? What's, is there some magic in those numbers? That's a great question. And so what he's referring to is uh, PL tones uh, or CTCSS. So they are subaudible tones, um, usually in the uh, between about 64 and 280 hertz. Um, and yeah, technically, you know, we humans can hear it, but most of the time your radio speaker cannot replicate that tone. And they're used uh, as uh, primarily in repeater situations where if you have a repeater on Mount Hood, it's going to pick up a lot of, of signals from all over Oregon and South Washington. And a lot of the uh, signals that it hears aren't necessarily from people that want to talk through that repeater. And so one of the ways that ham radio repeaters um, avoid retransmitting signals that are not intended to be retransmitted is by putting uh, a tone on that repeater. Meaning that if you want to, to talk through a repeater, and here's an example right here, 147.28, which is MC2, uses 167.9 Hertz as the tone. And so if you were to transmit on 147.28, even if you were standing right next to the repeater, unless you're transmitting 
along with your voice, that subaudible tone of 146.7, 146, 167.9, excuse me, uh, hertz, then the repeater will not retransmit your signal. Um, the tones, uh, the history of the tones are that it was started by Motorola and PL or private line was actually, I think it still is a registered trademark of Motorola. And it, the first users of it were taxicabs in New York um, who shared the same frequency or frequencies. And so a lot of times if you were a taxicab driver, you didn't care about you know, somebody that needed to be picked up across Manhattan, right? You didn't wanna to listen to that. And so the dispatchers would use these tones to only transmit to one or more people who actually wanted to receive the broadcast. And that way, if your radio was programmed not to uh, break squelch, unless there was a specific tone, then it's a little bit easier on the ears. Um, there are a series of, um, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second because I wanna pull up, because uh, this is actually such a great question. The, the list of tones. And most radios uh, already have, like almost all the radios have the tones already programmed into it. And so when you're programming your radio, especially for repeaters, um, you will need to know whether or not the repeater requires a tone. And if it does, then you'll need to program that tone into uh, your radio. So give me just a second. I want to pull up a spreadsheet that I made. And it, surprisingly, um, these tones, uh, this tone list that I'm going to show you is um, in a lot of the FRS radios uh, manual. And so you can see here, here's, um, I, I called it uh, PL frequency. Um, and so here there are 49 tones. Uh, and can you guys see that okay? I know it's a little small. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's all right. So 49 tones ranging from 67 hertz up to 250.3 hertz. Uh, most of the amateur radio stuff um, usually is, is down here uh, <coughs> in the lower tones. And what I've done is I just created a list that, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for example, FRS, like if it's a, hang on just a second. Please don't choke, Max. We need you. Yeah, thank you. I uh, <laughs> got some. Um, FRS radios use tones. Uh, for example, if you were to tell somebody, program your FRS radio for 2-2, that would tell them the first number would be a frequency, and the second number is a tone. Um, so FRS tone one is equal, um, in almost all radios, is equal to 67.0. Uh, tone. Motorola has some weird exceptions, um, but for the most part, um, there are 38 tones that usually are already programmed into all FRS radios. And so these, this is kind of the cross-reference list. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Max. Yeah. Any other questions for band plan? Well, so now I have, I have two questions. Yeah. So those are those are the repeaters, right? So <clears throat> since we can use anything on those bands, technically, uh, in between uh, 144 and 148 um, megahertz, right? Um, if I just wanted to call my best buddy who was like listening, and I said I'm going to call you on 144.68 or whatever. Can I just do that? You know, like in other words, can I just select another one? Can I use one of these tones without using a repeater? Can I not tones, but one of these frequencies? Um, if I try to use a frequency that there's a repeater on, would, would it automatically look in link into the repeater? Do I have to find another another frequency that's not in the in the range of a repeater in order for me to talk without the repeater? And that brings up another question is that if there's all these repeaters that are already up there, 
they cross, they cover a good bandwidth of all of the, that whole range from 144 to 148. So let's just say, you know, because I'm like a really advanced, you know, person and I, I just started yesterday, but I already know I'm going to set up a repeater. Um, where do I find the, the band, where do I find the bandwidth to set that repeater up inside that frequency range? So can, do I use the same band, do I use the same frequencies or do I, do I, you know, do I do an offset instead of 144, you know, 0. 0.6, you know, 0. 0.6, do I go to 144.7 and set it up with a 600, you know, 600 Hertz offset or whatever. Um, so how do you share all of these bands within that bandwidth? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so in general, uh, you, if you're trying to, uh, to answer your first question, if you want to contact or talk to your buddy, right, who is maybe in the next town over, um, you want to follow this Oregon uh, Region Relay Council band plan. So what that means is you don't want to talk, uh, if you're using simplex, then you don't want to transmit on any of these uh, orange, um, either a repeater inputs or repeater outputs. You don't want to, you know, talk on the packet um, uh, frequency slice. You want to use the, the simplex. So any channel here in this slice in pink uh, or here in, in this slice. And in general, there is not enough activity for you to say, oh darn, all the simplex frequencies are in use. Now that may change if there is an actual emergency like the big earthquake happens, then you'll probably find that there are is a ton of activity on all frequencies. But in general, in day-to-day, -day, you know, Monday through Sunday, um, you can find easily find a simplex frequency to talk to your buddy over in the next town over. So you don't want to talk on the repeater inputs or outputs or, or you especially want to avoid anything um, down here at the bottom because those are really reserved for um, single sideband or weak signals or propagation um, or satellites. So this OSCAR subband right here and here, uh, OSCAR are for satellites. So try to avoid um, using OSCAR or satellite frequencies for talking simplex to people that are not on the satellite. Um, the second part of your question is for those of you who are thinking of setting up a, a repeater somewhere, either on top of a mountain, in, on top of your house or something, um, you can definitely do that. Uh, repeaters, you know, they aren't too costly, especially if you use a used equipment, which most large repeaters do. Um, what you would need to do is is uh, get a or yeah get uh, assigned a repeater pair from the Oregon Region Relay Council. So if I wanted to set up a repeater on the top of my house, then I would go to their website and see if they have any unassigned repeater pairs. And repeater pair just simply means it's the input and the output frequency. And fortunately, in the Pacific Northwest here, especially if you get outside of the Portland area, there are a lot of unused repeater pairs versus in the Bay Area, and especially in um, Southern California, there haven't been available repeater pairs in, for decades. Um, for many reasons, you know, just because there are so many more people down there that a lot of these repeaters have been operating continuously for 50, 60 years, and they're not giving up their repeater pair. The only kind of thing that you could do is set up a repeater that is non-coordinated, which simply means that, uh, and sometimes the re regional relay council will have uh, a series of repeater pairs that are non-coordinated for temporary use. Um, so that's one possibility. Uh, I did I answer your questions, Barry? Um, yeah, well enough for me to, for what I need to understand for now, <laughs> since I'm not setting up another, I'm not going to set up another repeater, um, <laughs> I'm thinking by the time I get there, I probably will understand the stuff a little bit. I, I haven't even had my first conversation on, on, you know, on my radio yet, so uh, I still have a ways to go. Oh, cool. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, for hey, those Max, who are, So, yeah, go I ahead. Have a 
a follow on question to that so what what is what is the advantage of uh, me wanting to set up a repeater so why would i want to do that if you have a lot of extra money and maybe you have um, <laughs> a site already picked out, for example, maybe you live up on top of uh, a you know, tall mountain uh, or you have access to a tall building in a downtown area, yeah. um, or, or you had just a whole bunch of friends that um, you like to talk to on a regular basis and there was really no other repeater that serviced your area. Um, and just for example, like I'm sure over in Eastern other Oregon or uh, especially uh, Southeastern Oregon, there aren't a lot of um, repeaters there just simply because there aren't a lot of people there either. Um, but if you wanted to, um, you could as an individual, most of the times individuals don't put repeaters on the air just because they tend to be costly and they require a lot of maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, expect to pay, you know, a few thousand dollars a year in maintenance. And that's after you buy all the equipment uh, and get it all set up. And that could generally cost you anywhere from five to 20 plus thousand dollars. Um, however, there's a lot of open repeaters in the, especially in the Portland area. And a lot of them have really good coverage. So um, 147.04 is located in downtown Portland um, on top of a very tall building. It has fairly good coverage of the Portland area. Um, I think you can even get down to Salem. 147.12 is located up on Mount Hood, and that has excellent coverage. Um, you can, I think, even talk to people as far away as Eugene sometimes on that repeater. Um, so a lot of the repeaters, especially the, the ones that have been there for a long time, have uh, coverage anywhere from 50 to 150 miles. Um, and it's kind of a neat way just to use your handheld to be able to talk to people that are hundreds of miles away that you would never be able to talk to using Simplex. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And let's see if I have any other slides here. The other um, point I was going to make is there if, you, if you're interested in a very specific thing, for example, um, QRP, which means uh, low power. So there are a lot of people, a lot of ham radio operators who really enjoy the challenges of talking with people um, long distances that use no more than five, maybe 10 watts. Um, and it's certainly possible uh, to talk around the country, around the world um, using no more than five watts. And so if you wanted to find the best frequencies to transmit and receive on using either voice uh, or CW, Morse code, then you would want to look up some type of uh, QRP frequency list. And this is an example, uh, and this is from QRP ARCI. Um, they're a, um, a organization that anybody can join. Um, but they are solely dedicated to uh, QRP activities. And so they published this on their website. And you can see that for CW, uh, Morse code, if you wanted to talk on the 20 meter band, your best bet would be approximately 14.060 megahertz. And that's kind of where you want to start. Usually that's kind of a calling frequency. Um, again, the calling frequency, you don't want to like stay on and monopolize it, but if you start listening there and you kind of go up and down a few uh, kilohertz, that's this, this kind of uh, frequency list will help you find people who are using the same type of mode and power uh, that you are, if that makes sense. And there's, this list isn't necessarily gospel, meaning that there are many other people who think the best calling frequency for 20 meters is 146, uh, a 14.062 or a 14.040. Um, you can see in Europe uh, on some of these, um, I thought I saw Europe. Oh yeah, so the ones that are in italics are the preferences for Europe uh, versus the ones that are not italicized are generally for the US. And I think that was the all the slides that I had for today. Uh, just so you know, future meeting topics that we're going to talk about um, next week is going to be battery backup. 
And I believe there was a question uh, today in the registration that asked about um, using batteries uh, for your radios, especially in light of the recent um, power outages. Um, I here at my house had seven days uh, without power and was glad that I actually had radios that did have battery backup and I was able to turn it on. And the great thing was I was able to kind of listen and find out what was happening um, around my neighborhood. So were, was it just me that and my street that was out of power or was it, you know, my neighbors, you know, down the hill, uh, how widespread was it? What's happening? What's PGE saying? Things like that. Um, ham radio resources, uh, we're, we're gonna talk about like, and if you guys have any ham radio resources that you like uh, or have found useful, please feel free to, uh, you know, chime in with those. Um, we'll talk about logging and QSLs, emergency communications, HF radio, um, for those who wanna get into it or, or who are already into it, uh, home brewing and kit building and, and wind link. So are there any other questions? Uh, I think now we can just kind of open it up to any questions ham radio related. Uh, Max, question. This is yeah. Lee. Uh, in any of those areas, maybe emergency communications or ham radio resources, are you going to talk about uh, the transmission of photo, uh, digital photos in any of those? We actually, yeah, we can uh, definitely bring Max, it up. Max, can I quickly, I'm sorry, because that's a good question. And yeah. I want to dovetail what I was going to ask because it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Is WinLink or is there something there about using it for commuter, computer, like, you know, to li link your computer up to the, to the radio to, to send messages and stuff like that using your computer and your um, radio in addition to sending photos and videos and other stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. WinLink is a very specific protocol um, that you use to link your radio uh, with your computer. And for example, you can do different things like send email uh, without using the internet, not being connected to the internet. Um, but you can also send pictures and messages and other things like that using WinLink. Um, Lee, your question about uh, slow scan TV yeah. Um, is what I think you're referring to. Um, we do have a, a, a week that we're going to talk about slow scan TV, but we can actually uh, touch on that during our emergency communications um, session or, or any session really. And for those of you who aren't familiar with slow scan TV, it's a way to send um, pictures, send and receive pictures um, using uh, your radio. So for example, um, one of the easiest ways to get into slow scan TV is to use your smartphone to take a picture. And then you would still, you want to add your call sign to the picture itself because that's how you identify your radio transmission. But once you take a picture with your smartphone, then you can hold the smartphone up to the radio and transmit. And it will send a um, anywhere from 10 second to two minute uh, series of tones to anybody else in the area that is has a radio and is tuned to that frequency, and they can hold their smartphone up to their radio and receive the picture that you just took. Um, you don't necessarily have to use a smartphone. A lot of people use their computer that's connected directly with wires to the radio. But Lee, your question is great because for those of you who haven't uh, used slow scan TV, it's pretty cool. And it's pretty inexpensive to, um, to experiment around with it because if you already have a smartphone or a tablet or a computer and you have a radio, even a handheld radio, uh, there are groups um, that will kind of get together uh, and just trade pictures um, between themselves. It's great for emergency communications because if you have, instead of just saying I'm at this address and the house has multiple cracks in it, you can actually just take a picture and send it. And uh, you know what they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And if it only takes 30 seconds to send, that's a lot of words per minute. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Paul Stivers here, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I just joined a few days ago, actually. Sorry, I know I'm late here. No and problem. I I had sent this uh, question in, so if you already answered it, uh, um, yeah. is there any advantage 
to having a general license over a technician license for CW specifically? Yes. Yeah, let me, um, I'm going to put back up the um, national band plan. And this is a band plan that's uh, published by the ARRL. Um, and I was saying earlier that if, if there's one thing that you take away, print out, and put next to your radio, I, I do have that. Cool. Yeah. So what one thing that you'll see is that in the, um, let me make sure I'm, I'm speaking correctly. Um, in the 12 meters and below, so 12, 15, 17, 20, uh, and on below, you'll see that for the most part, the technicians, they get some band privileges on 15, 40, and 80. Um, 40 is a good, uh, the two most popular uh, bands for HF are 40 and 20. So it's 20 during the day, 40 at night, just by way of how they propagate. Um, so if you wanted to do CW, uh, you have privileges on 40 and 80, um, but really that means that you can only get you know, the, into the popular 40 meters at night when it's usually um, uh, active. However, you're kind of locked out of the 20 meters. Um, so if you are interested in uh, CW, then I would highly recommend going, getting your general license because not only does that open you up to almost all the frequencies below 10 meters, but it also allows you to talk uh, using voice on the HF bands. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, it'll take more experience for me to internalize all of it. But yeah. um, the reason I asked is because I talked to a gentleman at, uh, I think it's named Amateur Radio, uh, up in, in Tiger. Anyway, um, he made it sound like I, it was mandatory. It's not mandatory, it's just pretty advantageous. Yeah, absolutely. So in I, fact, I understood it that way. I probably misunderstood. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say the only mandatory thing is if you wanted to use a uh, voice. So if you didn't want to to bother learning Morse code, using HF isn't very fun because you're really the your only HF band is going to be 10 meters, and yes, you do get a pre pretty big uh, chunk between 28.3 and 28.5 up here. Uh, this uh, yellow, which is single sideband phone. The problem is that during this low sunspot cycle, which we're kind of, we're just getting out of, um, 10 meters isn't gonna get you very far. It might get you, you know, 50 miles, maybe a hundred miles, but during high sunspot cycle times, uh, especially during the 50s, 60s, and even the 90s, um, when we had a lot of sunspots, you could um, uh, transmit around the world on 10 meters. Uh, voice, but unfortunately, that's just not the case anymore. Um, so if you really want to use voice, the best thing to do is get your general. Um, if you're primarily interested in CW, you could get by with uh, just a technician. Yeah, I'm interested in the CW itself. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Can I ask Can I a follow-up question, perhaps? Hey, Stevie. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Uh, the frequency band plan that you showed earlier, um, if I understand correctly, the technician level even, because that's where I am. I'm, I'm working on general, but I still have my technician. Uh -huh. My radio is a two meter, 70 centimeter radio. And so I was wondering, um, in order to practice and get over mic fright, is there like a newbie net? that I should be checking in on or? There is. is. Yeah, yes. so talk more about that because that's what I think I need most. <laughs> yeah, you. absolutely. You, so I would say for newbies, you don't necessarily have to check into a newbie net. You could check into any net that you hear. Um, and I would, I, I don't know of any net that doesn't allow visitor check-ins. So for example, if you um, go to the, Portland Amateur Radio Club um, website, you'll see a list of nets that you could check into. The one that the uh, club kind of sponsors every week is on every Monday at seven o'clock. Uh, but let me look up because they just started kind of like a, a newbie net specifically for, um, for that. And somebody just sent me an email. And if you can just give me a minute, I will 
I will find it. Um, but I encourage you to just go to um, like either the Portland Amateur Radio Club or the ARRG, um, which is the, uh, I don't remember the name of the, uh, the group, but um, if you Google ARRG Portland, I'll bet it's the first one that comes up. Yep. So they'll have a list of nets on there too, local net list. And I'm just gonna share my screen here. Some of these are HF uh, and some like here, for example, um, 7268 kilohertz is uh, in the 40 meter band, 37, uh, 3970 kilohertz is in the 80 meter band. But there are some that are, here's a uh, Columbia County Aries 146.78. Um, so do a search for nets like in the area, depending on if you're in Clackamas County or Multnomah County. Um, on any typical week, especially in the Portland area, you're, there's going to be 30 nets at least, um, it's, you know, uh, two meters and 70 centimeters. Um, and like I said, let, if you just give me a second, I can find that. And I think is Dan on? Uh, he was on and nick is he still on I don't yeah think. i'm here uh oh cool are you referring yeah. to the 10 o'clock one on sunday evening the, the new one um uh, yes yes do you have information on that it's uh yes it's it's four four three decimal one five oh plus five and a pl of one zero seven dot two Sunday evening at 10 p.m. and it and I it last Sunday was the first time and uh it's a good one to to ask any question mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah and it was somebody that was I think on here uh a few Kevin weeks Mc ago that that started it was it. John McBride John McBride okay thank you Could, is it possible that you could put that information into the chat? Will do. Cool. And that's that net uh, is new, like she said. It, uh, this I think will be their second time this Sunday, um, and it's for newbies. Um, and it's just a great idea. I, you know what? This happens to everybody. Um, I've been helping hams for quite a few years, and just the whole Mike Fright thing is a is it is real. Um, and it's real not only for uh, voice, but it's also real for CW and HF voice and everything in between. Um, it's something that we all have to get over uh, at some time in our ham career. Um, but I would really encourage you, uh, the best way to um, kind of get over it is just to check into a net is probably one of the best ways. And um, be sure to listen to the net first to find out what the protocol is. Some nets, they will have people who have checked in before check in first. Others will have members only check in first. But almost all nets, uh, I can't even think of an exception, um, will uh, at some point say any visitor check ins um, or any non member check ins. And that's the time that you want to check in. And the great thing is that checking in usually requires just giving your call sign, uh, potentially giving your name or your location. Um, and then that's it. So they uh, will generally recognize you, uh, K2MAX, uh, thanks for checking in. Uh, and then that's it. So that's a great question, Stevie. Hey, uh, this is Marino. Um, hey, Marino. Hey, how's it going? Good. So for Stevie, also, there is another network, uh, a net uh, called uh, Northwest Traffic and Training Net. net uh, that happens every day at 6 or 5 p.m. So if you don't wanna you know, wait until once a week, you can show up every day at 6 <laughs> or 5 there and listen in. And uh, that is a specific kind of net where it is a, a, a net where some uh, message traffic is passed, which means that there's some people might come in and relay some sort of telegrams or radiograms they're called are uh, you know sent by other people are relayed uh, locally here in Portland to the final destination. 
but it is good because uh, it is an app that happens every day and uh, you just wait for your turn. Usually they section the call signs uh, A through Z in chunks like A through D, E through J and so on. And you just need to remember to chime in and check in when uh, uh, your section comes in. What is your section? Basically, you have a call sign. My call sign is KG7EMV. My suffix is EMV. So if they're calling call signs uh, E through J, that's my sign that my call, my, my signal that I can check in because I'm KG7EMV. And so you, you check in with your suffix uh, call sign. So anyway, just another idea. And yeah, that's really I, helpful to, to know that there's those different types of nets. So to listen first becomes even more important. So thank you for that. Yes, another thing, another tip I can give you is uh, keep, uh, again, uh, a notepad and, and a pencil nearby and write down the call signs and the names of the people checking in. And, uh, you know, over time, you will learn to recognize people for, <laughs> for their voice and or for their name, and, and it will become more familiar. And also is a great uh, training for using and thinking uh, about using the ITU phonetics, which is, you know, the specific alphabet uh, spelling that we use it to make sure that when we spell out things, we spell it out in the same way. This is Kirk. Um, don't be afraid to try the simplex channels anytime, day or night. Um, like 146.52 uh, and what is it? One, what, 446. I forget the UHF one. 446.0. zero. Okay. Yep. And just call out your call sign and say listening um, and see if anybody comes back to you. Um, it's, it's a good way to. Uh, you know, the, during the middle of the day, you'll find the retired people and work at home people out are on it. In the evenings, you'll get almost anybody on them. So um, some of them may be scratchy, some of them may come in loud and clear, but it's a, it's a nice place to pick up the microphone and get used to using it. That's a great suggestion, Kirk. Yeah, and I would also uh, say, do the same thing with repeaters, um, the popular ones around the Portland area. Um, Feel free, you know, listen for a minute just to make sure that nobody's in a conversation and you're not interrupting anybody. But uh, you can always, uh, on repeaters, just throw out your call sign, K2MAX listening, um, which, yes, you're listening, but it's, all, it's also kind of the way that people call CQ or calling anybody. So if there's somebody that wants to talk, um, they will most likely come back and say, hey, K2MAX, uh, this is Ray, how are you doing? Um, so that's that's another good way. It can be a little nerve wracking because you don't know whoever you know who you're going to get to talk to, um, and sometimes nobody will call you back. Um, but if you do that uh, a couple times a day, you will uh, almost be guaranteed to uh, to talk to somebody. Yeah. Hi, this is Barry. Uh, you know what? Um, I wanted to tag on to that because I, I read an article in um, the ARRL. They have a new magazine that, that uh, they're that uh, and they, they had somebody who, you know, was talking about how do you get on the first time and the experience they described was that they would get on to one of these repeaters and they would kind of say their, you know, they would introduce themselves and say listening, 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 and no one answered. Um, it took a really long time before somebody answered and her what her suggestion was. And I, I will probably get this wrong because I don't remember exactly what the phrase you're supposed to use is, but ask for an equipment check. Mm -hmm. She asked, you know, for an equipment check to, you know, to see, are they getting, you know, are you getting my signal? And suddenly five people answered. So there were people on the, you know, there were people who were on the airwaves. They just weren't replying to her. So once, once she asked that, then all these people then replied and she was able to start a conversation with them and kind of get into the swing of things, so. Yeah, that's a great point, Barry. Um, and because, you know, if you're, if it's the first few times of uh, calling people through a particular repeater, um, that's a really good thing to do anyway, just to find out if other people are hearing you. Um, and usually the, the, you know, one common way that I've heard 
people do it is just this is K2MAX. Uh, does anybody can give me a radio check? Um, and they'll come back and they'll usually just describe your signal, how well it's getting into the repeater. Um, and then sometimes you can start a conversation with those people. Thanks, Barry. Don't thank me, thank her. <laughs> I'm just accumulating stories like this for when I build up the courage to actually go on. Get yeah, them. absolutely. Yeah, and the magazine that you brought up is is new for AWRL uh, starting in 2000 last year. It's called uh, uh, On the Air. And when you join the AWRL, you can either get uh, On the Air in print that's printed six times a year, uh, or you can get QST six, uh, 12 times a year um, as the magazine that you get in print. However, um, the AWRL publishes four major publications, uh, and you can get all of them now as a member um, for no extra cost, uh, the digital versions. So if you're not an AWRL member yet, I highly encourage you to, uh, it's $49 a year and it's definitely money well spent. Any other questions, Ham Radio? I've got an announcement in case yeah. you haven't heard. Uh, Oregon has activated the shake alert system for earthquakes as of today at 10 a.m. Um, it's an experiment. It's, it's been an, an experimental uh, process. I think California has already done it, um, but it will send alerts at the first notification or sense of an earthquake to your cell phones. So oh, that's great. Do you know? Do you have to sign up for it, or is this like a location? Uh, it's a free app. It's a, they have both Android and and iPhone apps. Uh, I would go look at the Play Store and whatever the Apple one is um, and look up Shake Alert. And it may only give you a minute's worth of notice, but that's better than no notice. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a minute. So anyway. That's awesome. Thank you, Kurt. kind of FYI for everybody that's in the preparedness and just uh, personal safety in general. So that was activated today at 10 a.m. for Oregon. Actually work? Supposedly. Matter of fact, when you first call it up, um, it'll give you a list of recent earthquakes and things that they've tracked. So um, the governor signed off on it. And again, they've been testing in California and other places. So uh, again, it's not, it's not a predictor. It's not going to tell you there'll be an earthquake today. It's uh, 8.55 p.m. It's like there was an earthquake someplace. And you are uh, you may be in the affected area in 30 seconds, two minutes, whatever the, the distance is and how strong it is and that sort of thing. So I haven't played a lot with it yet, but um, it's no cost. Um, Do you know the official name? Because I just did Shake Alert in the App Store, and I'm not finding anything. I, so, I, am, I just put the chat room uh, a link in the chat room. Um, thank you, Marino. Yeah. I do see here, however, contradicts a little bit what you were saying. Uh, no sign up is required to receive a shake alert notification. No action needs to be taken other than enabling emergency alerts in your phone. So that, uh, you know, that's the page. Go there. And, yeah. Uh, it looks like it has directions for Apple and Android, and you just have to um, go into the settings and enable it. That's cool. Thank you very much, Kirk. I uh, I didn't even know about that. Yeah, good call. Yeah, I stumbled across it. So. Yes, thank you very much. Very helpful. I knew it was coming. I didn't know it was here. Yeah, no, during um, the smoke uh, and the fires that we had last year. I'm in Oregon City. And so I, I received quite a few notifications on my phone about uh, evacuations, um, just based on my phone location. So which is very helpful. It's, uh, um, I think that's great that, uh, you know, you could be sleeping and, and um, get an alert about some type of emergency that you really should know about. Is that also enabling um, the amber alerts and stuff? I seem to remember at one time I was getting amber alerts and either they haven't had them or something got turned off on my phone. Yeah, I, uh, I have gotten them too. Um, 
And I think I remember getting one recently and there's probably, yeah, it looks like uh, Marino is holding up a, uh, let me um, highlight him, but it looks like uh, at least in, is that Android Marino? No, this is an iPhone, but if iPhone. you go into settings notification at the bottom, there is a section called government. Of, what am I doing? So yeah, you, down to, a bit. There you, yeah, go. you uh, have to scroll all the way down to the bottom, like past all of the other apps. Yeah, government, alert. government alerts. There's government alerts. Yeah. That's and you true. can, it's Amber alerts, emergency alerts, and public safety alerts. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Marino. Yeah. Thank you. Too. Any, so it looks like we have uh, about five minutes left. Any other questions? Was this helpful learning a little bit about band plans? Hopefully, uh, learn something new that you didn't know before. Oh yeah, I, I I learn some stuff every time I look at the thing. It's really quite a a, a dense piece of information if you really look at it. It's, there's a lot there. Yeah, it is. And you're talking specifically about the uh, the ARRL band plan. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It. You know what? It takes a little while to understand it, even. Um, but what I found is that. Uh, the more you use um, the different frequencies, the more you'll kind of just remember, um, for example, like your favorite uh, simplex frequencies or what the you know, start and end of the two meter frequency is. Um, so uh, when you get into HF, you know, uh, with your general license, that really opens up a lot of the frequencies that you can use. Um, it's you know, a little bit of memorization, but it's kind of one of those things, the more you use it, the more you remember. Yeah, I think uh, for those of us who are more into um, emergency response, we don't have a tendency to venture outside of a certain limited number of frequencies. And so consequently, when you talk about the band plan, it exposes me to things that I have not really thought about because I stick within Multnomah County's uh, band plan, which is pretty limited. So, so that's uh, the benefit I got out of this uh, discussion tonight is uh, to expand what I think, well, what I, into things I don't know about the band. Yeah, yeah emergency services generally uh, are going to use VHF, UHF frequencies, um, just because it is local, uh, the radios are pretty inexpensive. Um, but if you ever want, uh, there's plenty of uh, emergency communications in both HF and even six meter. Um, and that's really a good way to get out of the area. So if there was an event here, um, like the earthquake that we're all kind of expecting, um, there's not going to be a lot of communication in and out of the area. Um, but HF is typically going to be both voice and um, CW, is it, and digital too, actually, uh, is a great way to um, talk from here to Texas or other places that maybe you're not affected by the disaster. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Comment. Hey, Denny. Hey. Uh, all the talk about earthquakes and apps and stuff. Uh, Multnomah County ARES says when you feel the shake, go to 28. 147.28 repeater is where ARES will come up if they're going to be activated. So. If you want to listen in, that's where to go. And that's where all the earthquake information will be. And I'd like to say to you, Max, this is an outstanding presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Denny. Yeah, and just to, to kind of piggyback on what Denny just said, um, this is the um, Multnomah County Aries, and you can see MC2 is 147.28. And it looks like that's the, uh, they list it as the Multnomah secondary repeater, but that's that's great if they're um, basically saying, hey, this is the frequency to go to when you uh, feel shaking. And I would assume probably for other disasters too, um, because when you're presented with a bunch of frequencies, um, you definitely wanna know which one everybody's gonna go to first. Yeah. So in fact, uh, if you look uh, another comment there, if you look, uh, uh, MC2 is listed, the one that Danny is talking about mm -hmm. is listed as a resource net. And what is a resource net? 
A resource in that uh, is a net that is uh, stood up in, came in time of emergency just to collect uh, the resources available to then deploy to the command net, uh, which is in, in looking at the chart MC1. So in theory, the protocol is if there is an emergency and if you are a, a, a Mary's operator, you show up first in uh, MC2, you tell them that you are available, you, they most, most, like, most likely ask you, what do you have available? What is your setup with power? For how long can you be operational, et cetera, et cetera. And then you stand by until the ARIS uh, uh, management decide where to deploy you and, and then they will give you further instructions. One way could be go to MC1 and you know perform this kind of job or to be something different. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Mario. I, one thing I do notice is that uh, MC12, uh, so if something happened to the 147.28 MC2, it looks like MC12 is the resource net simplex uh, if MC2 is offline. So I would definitely, um, th this is a great list, and this is only the, the regional um, plan for Multnomah County areas. Um, there are a lot more frequencies than this. So I encourage you to go to the Multnomah County Aries website, download their, um, their band frequency list or their frequency list, um, and keep it in a binder somewhere uh, on paper because um, it'll come in handy when you don't have power. Yeah. Cool. Well, we are at the 7.30 mark. I appreciate everybody joining in. Um, again, next week is the topic is going to be battery backup, um, which for me is uh, a really interesting topic because most people, most of you guys are in it for emergency communications and batteries are really one of the first things that you really want to kind of start thinking about. Um, because if you have a mobile radio that only works if you plug it in the, in the wall, um, if there is some type of disaster and there's no power coming out of the wall, then what? Uh, and for very little money, you can actually get into um, getting a, a, a pretty decent battery backup, you know, one that could last for 12 hours or 24 hours. Um, if you have a lot of money, you could go hog wild, but most of us don't have the space for that. So cool. Anyway, I want to thank everybody for attending this time. Um, I'm kind of a little bit backlogged on getting some of the, uh, the videos up, but this weekend I'm going to dedicate some time to getting all the uh, past videos up from this meeting series and also the um, Portland Amateur Radio Club regular meetings. Thank you, Max. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for everybody for joining and I will see you next week.